Hey, it's Paul at FocusPulling.com. This video has been a long time coming. For as long as we've been waiting for the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K to arrive. But now that I've been using it for about a week, I've thrown together this complete guide to every feature and every menu item, combined with some visual samples and some review comments along the way. All the specs of this camera have been discussed ad nauseum in the months leading up to its release. So I'll be spending most of the time going into sort of the nitty gritty and the details of how to actually use the thing. But some of the key features have included this big chunky grip. It does have a very wide berth and a gigantic touchscreen on the back. Some ports that include a full-sized HDMI output, a USB-C port for docking a solid state drive for extra capacity, and an audio input that's XLR with phantom power. Over at FocusPulling.com, what you're seeing here is something that I had thrown together in the weeks leading up to the release of the Blackmagic camera. And they were some answers to some niche and complicated technical questions that seemed unanswered from the typical vlogs and blogs. But I got the answers straight from Blackmagic, so it's something you might want to check out if you haven't seen yet for things less to do with performance and use and more with features. But to start things off here, I thought it'd be a good idea to just sort of give a peek at what this camera is capable of shooting and then use that occasion by wandering around DC yesterday to sort of run the camera through some potential trouble spots that I imagine might occur because of my experience with the prior Pocket HD. And one of them was the so-called black holes that would show up in blown out highlights. I've frozen there for a sec. At least they're not there, but the roll off of highlights isn't very elegant. So that's something I'm going to keep my eye on. Stability is also a huge challenge because of the form factor. You don't have a third point of contact with any eyepiece, so you're kind of always holding it out in front of you. Um, and in that regard, even with a stabilized lens with power OIS, I'm clearly struggling here. Uh, like this guy is. Life in DC. The next shot's going to show you indoors, and I'm going to calm down here for a second so you can hear the sound. So that's how it sounds recording from the internal mics, actually a four mic array that's used for honing in on sounds and it offers the option for tuning in post, but the preamps also um, for the internal recording of the uh, Pocket Cinema Camera 4K is vastly improved over the HD predecessor. Here we're getting ready for a rolling shutter test. Since this is not global shutter, the thing we always worry about is whether we get the wobble effect and there's kind of no getting around it, so I'm freezing in two spots there. And particularly at the end, you'll just see that is simply not the curvature of the back of any subway car, but it's the best it can do. This is 120 frames per second, but it's actually in windowed HD. So it's a two times crop factor from the already two times crop factor of the Micro Four Thirds sensor. And that said, it performs exceptionally well. These are the Kavanaugh protests at the Supreme Court. But I was really impressed with it, and I think it outpaces any other uh, portable camera on the market for shooting slow motion. So after that brief teaser of video samples, time to at least preface this incredibly long video to say that it's much easier to navigate if you use the indexed hyperlinks in the caption below this video um, so that you can skip around to the area that you're most interested in. There might be things you already know and also um, there is a corresponding even more interactive uh, web version of this at focuspulling.com where you can actually get discrete video screens for each of the sections so it's really easier to navigate. But uh, if you want to take the deep dive with me all the way to the end, we'll be seeing more visual samples along the way, a few exteriors, and then we'll wrap up by exploring um, the peculiar feature called dual native ISO. So what's the setup here for this guide? What we're actually doing is we're shooting using an A7 III, a Sony A7 III, onto the back panel of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. I'll just say Pocket 4K. But then look at what it's looking at. So then it's looking at the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, which is what it used to be called until this guy came along. Now we guys, I guess we could just call it the Pocket HD. So it's sort of a, I don't know, a farewell shot of um, the old standby that caused us so much grief, but still was such a revolution, and the Pocket 4K feels no less revolutionary. 
Um, as I'm going through a lot of the menu options and pointing at things, I'll often be using this pen stylus um, just to get my fat fingers out of the way. But sometimes, inevitably, I will have to be sliding things around and touching the screen with my fingers. So you'll see this a lot. And then one more thing is that I do have an alternate view that I can always pull up. So I'll be oscillating back and forth, mostly staying in this view, but I can, I'm also via the HDMI port on the left of the camera when you're looking from the back. It sends out a 1080p feed to, in this case, an Atomos Shogun. And I'm recording that with some of the overlays enabled, but the reason I even had to set things up this way with an actual view of the physical screen with all of its flaws, including a little bit of, uh, I don't know what you could call it, electrical noise or um, jitters or strobing or something um, from video shooting video. Um, the reason I had to shoot it this way is because the HDMI output, though it is versatile in being able to customize what is overlaid and what is not overlaid, it can't send out a view of the menus. That's interesting because the Sony a7 III, for example, definitely can send, send out a view of the menus. And my last um, very long video that was the complete walkthrough of the a7R3 certainly did that. I think that Blackmagic didn't see a point to that because there's no cursor and no visible navigation on the touchscreen menus for the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, Pocket 4K. So since that's the case, um, we're having to go back and forth. Okay, cool. One more prologue to all of this before really getting to the heart of the matter, which is the menus themselves, is to walk around the screen and just to get familiar with what you see when you're typically shooting with a live view. And the value of that too is the fact that you might end up actually accessing, so, so to speak, menu items from this interface by tapping on the particular metadata that's visible. So starting from the top left and going clockwise, um, ignoring these frame guide and LUT icons that are just indicators, it turns out that you can tap most of these and we can start by tapping this top left item, which is frames per second, FPS. And when I tap it, with this, then it pulls up this little pop-out um, slider. And with the slider, I can either kind of change the value this way in big increments. And so you have the standard uh, frame rates from hipster jittery, um, and then you can bump up to, um, and that's of course the cinema version. Then we have standard um, uh, PAL, P-A-L, in the European territories frame rate for broadcast. Then we have the U.S. standard for broadcast. I don't need to show you all of them, but um, the capability, the native capabilities of this camera are kind of amazing. As we know, it can shoot up to 60p in full um, 4K resolution. So uh, one more thing to note about this is that for all of these slider menus, there will also usually be these sort of cursor icons where you can just tap it once and move back. Over here, you have something that says off-speed frame rate. So it sounds a little tricky at first because it sounds as though you're basically saying, yeah, I'm changing the frame rate to something that's off the speed that I was using before, and that's that. But actually what it's really implying is that you can change the frame rate relative to the ultimate codex um, playback resolution. So if the actual codec is meant to record in... Um, in 29.97 frames per second, when I have it set to off-speed frame rate at 60, when it dumps it into the 30-ish frames per second, it'll look like um, one half speed motion or slow motion. But you can more basically fine-tune adjust these sorts of off-speed frame rates using the slider while recording into a set frame rate. We're getting to get into the more of the high frame rate, which actually has its own dedicated physical button over here a little later when we dig farther into the menus. But that option still is available to you right here as a slight variant on the ability to go slow motion, basically. So I'm going to turn that back off. And here we are back again at 29.97. When you get these little fly, fly up from the bottom menus, you can tap anywhere else to kind of get out of them. It's an exit, if you will. Um, moving quickly along, then you have shutter speed, and sure enough, just like the other one, you can tap it and then get this interface here where you can basically proceed forward. And of course, according to the rules of physics and all cameras in the universe, the higher the shutter speed, it just cycled back, the darker it gets because it has less uh, time to capture from all the photo sites, whatever image is presented to the camera sensor. So 
Uh, just a little review, of course. Um, why do we see one slash 60? Well, it's because I actually changed from the default settings. I'm too stuck on the way I've always done things. There is a way by default, actually, that the camera tells you what the shutter speed is by presenting you with an, a shutter angle, it's called. And then most all of the time, any competent cinematographer, unless they have a really good reason, like 1% of the time during a film, they're going at 180 degrees for proper motion blur, whatever the frame rate is. Um, and in this case, since my frame rate is basically 30 frames per second, the rule uh, of this, this cinematographer's rule is that the denominator of the shutter speed needs to be double the frame rate. So the proper shutter speed for proper motion blur, for not looking like an amateur strobe GoPro video without proper ND filtration and so on, is to have it be 1 60th when you're shooting at the standard um, 30 frames per second. Again, non-hipster, non-jittery frame rate that I personally use for every project I've ever shot. So there we are. Iris, um, once again, you tap it, and then you're presented with the ability down at the bottom to change the iris value. And here I am sort of closing down, making the aperture smaller with a higher number. Another universal law of physics and all cameras in the universe is that this, the higher the F number, the tinier the hole gets. And the tinier the hole gets, the darker it gets. Um, this is the first place though where we're seeing something that is able to do something because of the fact that the camera is currently connected to uh, an actual native micro four thirds lens with electronic contacts. And since it is able to control the uh, aperture, then we can um, use the menu interfaces to do that. Point being, if you have a manual lens on, this will do nothing. So it's almost kind of disabled, if you will. Um, you can consider it that way. One other thing that we'll explore really quick while, around, while we're on the subject of native lenses is that if you do have a lens that is native and therefore can do autofocusing, then sure enough, um, the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, the Pocket 4K, does have a very simple autofocus ability that, you, that might surprise you in terms of how often you'll use it, which I'll explain a little later. But in a nutshell, you can tap anywhere on the viewfinder screen and then at that spot, within a, you know, a certain sort of fudge factor, it will rack to that focus area. But, but, it looks ugly as shit. So when you do it, you'll see that it kind of goes in and out. Now that isn't new because like, let's say for example, any smartphone that has an autofocus function with moving lens elements um, still has that sort of ugly motion. But, you know, some cameras don't. I'm going to go back again, and you'll see it bounce back in and out when it racks onto the, the original Pocket HD. Uh, the Sony a7 III that I'm shooting with right now, it's in manual right now. But when I fly on a gimbal, the a7 III just totally rocks. It's the best camera on the market right now in terms of always magically nailing focus. Um, and it does so in a way that doesn't bounce back and forth like that. And you can even change in the settings the racking speed. You can make it really slow and elegant. So, um, you know, boo-hoo. But then again, there's a sort of conceit with anybody who owns a Blackmagic product that you would never use autofocus. So um, sort of, but maybe not. Um, but what we can say about it is that it can be a handy tool when you need to tap somewhere on the screen. Incidentally, you can even see how it is precise enough to even see the distinction at this pretty wide aperture. I'm at f2.4. That means that this is out of focus and therefore the focus peaking. In other words, the little red sprinkles, they aren't showing up down here on the lettering. But if I tap it, it really nailed focus down there to the detriment of this up here, which is just a few, literally an inch farther back um, at from this precise prime focal length. Right now I have a, a 20 five millimeter f 1.7 native panasonic lens on the pocket so that's an explanation of how focusing works and um, when you're flying on a gimbal and you of course don't have any ability to have continuous autofocus track objects and um, you certainly don't have uh, any remote control capability um, then you might be surprised at how handy it is to be able to just tap the screen to nail focus, at least at the current focal length that you're shooting at while you're flying on a gimbal. 
um, similar to that in general, I just another insight is that um, the value of us right now going through all of these and the value altogether of being able to access some settings here instead of using the hard buttons over on the top here or on the sides here or in the menu itself, which was the meat of the video we're finally getting to after a few minutes, um, is that it doesn't shake the camera. So you can imagine when you're flying on a gimbal and the motors are fighting against gravity and fighting against motion, to be able to tap this stuff lightly and to pull up a menu and to be able to change settings and to grab focus this way and to change um, ISO values, which we're getting to in a second, without pushing hard physical buttons or moving around a uh, dial is extremely valuable, especially when you have non-stabilized lenses. And again, while you're flying on a gimbal where the motors would just freak out if you did that. So um, that's awesome. And in fact, many DSLR cameras on the market that are more consumery, they certainly don't have that capability. So don't underestimate the value of, of just going straight to functions. Um, but speaking of functions and having gloated about how great it is, this one you're probably not going to use much. This actually toggles when you touch it between time code that's relative to HDMI clock versus um, natural clock, which is to say physical clock, um, you know, world clock. And then there's also a mode that just starts counting up based on how much you've recorded. Um, I'm just leaving it at defaults, and I never really look at that. But it's something you might care to be able to toggle between, I doubt. ISO, when you tap it, here we are. Oops, I actually autofocused because I didn't hit it. Um, we are back in the same interface where you can actually either, um, with a single tap, go forward to the next natural ISO value, um, or you can, again, drag the slider, which bumps by big values. So it doesn't go in small increments, unfortunately. As to ISO, we'll definitely be spending some reasonable, some meaningful time exploring one of the camera's coolest features that was previously seen at the consumer level on the GH5S, which is dual native ISO. Um, just a preview of that is that the, the nutshell is that once you get to 1000, the noise floor is actually getting pretty high. Now granted, I would be adjusting other things like aperture and so on, but the noise floor is high here compared to when I go to 1250, the noise floor bumps down um, and the reason that it bumps down is because of the fact that it's activating a completely separate, if you will, electrical circuit. It's not quite engineering accurate way to describe it, but it's as if you're using another sensor. That's why they say dual native ISOs. Um, and by accessing the higher ISO sensor and being at that low of the high sensors, um, 3200 uh, native ISO at 1250, the noise floor becomes very low. So uh, the lesson will be when we talk more about this that you probably are going to end up shooting most of your projects starting at 1250, but we'll get there. And that's to say for the maximum dynamic range possible. But I'm going to go back to down to 200 since, um, and I'm going to get my focus back again by tapping on the camera. Okay, next up, uh, over to here we have white balance, and when I tap it, we get a little bit more of a menu to pop up. And what we're actually getting here is um, a few different icons that are the familiar pictorial icons that you see on a typical consumer camera. And we have sunshine, we have light bulb, which is to say incandescent or tungsten, we have fluorescent, we have rainy day, which is to say overcast, and this is mirror clouds. What you see activated right now is CWB, which stands for constant white balance, but this is gonna be a little different in terms of the way it behaves compared to um, DSLRs. Constant white balance doesn't quite mean that um, we have chosen one of these or not, and it also doesn't mean that you've chosen any specific Kelvin value. It simply means that you're in a non sort of standard mode. So anything that isn't currently one of these this is the place where you're always going to end back up again with a specific value. And by that, I mean you can simply adjust the Kelvin values by pretty small increments so that your white balance varies that way. I picked 4800K because that looked about right given this mixed color temperature environment. Um, the back panel display is very blue compared to the other even indoor lighting. Um, this is a tint adjustment that's sort of a fine tuning, if you will. So you can see how that operates independently of the Kelvin value. 
Um, and then one more important thing to note about the white balance feature is that when I go to what's called AWB, what we're accustomed to when we see AWB is continuous white balance. So that as I turn my camera, let's say from a window to an indoor light, that it would auto adjust. This camera is not capable of that. So it's very analogous to the autofocus limitation that we ran into earlier, where I can't do it continuously. What auto white balance actually means is that it's grabbing white balance. So when I tap it, I go into a new mode that gives me a fairly tolerant box. And at the box, I could, and I'm just going to do this roughly, I don't have a proper white card or gray card as is best, but you know, let's just throw something here. And then when I confirm update white balance, then it grabbed white balance from my white card. And then when I go back here, we'll see that it actually assigned a value that feels to me a little bit off. It's 50-50 Kelvin. And 50-50 Kelvin is um, maybe a little bit too warm and warm meaning lower Kelvin than I wanted. So I think, where was I before? Some radically different value, like 58, wasn't I, or something? I can't quite recall. I think it was at 5,800 Kelvin. But, um, and then I think I was over here at 15. So it grabbed its best approximation, but again, I didn't use a proper gray card, and it wasn't pulled correctly. But you can see how auto white balance is not truly auto, but it's rather being able to pull white balance from an unfortunately non-movable centered white balance pull. So there's white balance. That'll save us some time when we get to the menu. And we're almost there. Tint is that number we saw over here. Okay. On the top right, that's indicating right now, as you could clearly tell, when it says AC, that means alternating current, which is to say it's plugged into the wall. In the U.S., um, we use alternating current at 60 hertz, 120 volts. The Pocket 4K comes with adapters for European territories, too, and then the power supply auto adjusts. But the key here is that it also doubles as a battery indicator if you are running off of battery. So I'm going to, with some risk here, since it will shake things, I'm going to go ahead and unplug the power from the Pocket 4K. And then we'll see the icon change, and this introduces a sad fact about the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. And the sad fact is um, the fact that it's just universally inaccurate. There is never any way to get a good read on this under all circumstances. One circumstance is that you could be um, using the battery that came with the pocket, and then it says 0% for some reason, and it doesn't even give you an accurate reading, even though this is uh, a full at 100%. Um, the other one is that it won't show you the percentage value, but it'll give you sort of a bar reading. That's another type of LPE6 camera. Um, that was the DSTEs, I think, that I tried. And then if you use a native Canon uh, battery, there's anecdotal reports that that's the best in terms of giving you a proper percentage and so on. But even then, after a certain point, it just completely falls off the map. There comes a point where it just shuts down quickly. So... I'm going to plug this back in, and then we'll see the um, icon change once again. This is always a little tricky because of the proprietary two-button Limo connector that Blackmagic used. Limo-like connector, they emphasize. It's not actually Limo. So now we see it says AC again. And then also what showed up, if you look real close, you can see a little lightning bolt. The lightning bolt signifies that... Um, during the time, of course, when I had it unplugged, the, it was using battery power. So it's now charging the battery, and it'll only take a couple minutes until it's back to full charge. Um, so when you see AC plus the charge symbol, it means it's plugged into a wall outlet and then charging via AC. Fun side note, um, when you connect uh, a USB-C cable, you can recharge the battery, but you absolutely cannot run off of USB-C because it's a 5-volt feed by, by default. I've suggested to Blackmagic and hope they um, take into account the ability of USB-C power delivery, or PD, to be able to increase the voltage to proper amounts that would run the battery um, during shooting. But they haven't implemented that, and maybe they won't ever. Um, but anyways, this is I'll I'm making a vid, rigging video later on to follow up the the viral Pocket HD uh, rigging video that I made some years ago, and that'll be in the next few months once I gather up all the accessories. So 
There's our power indicator. Okay, down here we get into audio. And again, for each of these features, I'm gonna go all the way for as long, however many hours or minutes it takes. But this is a way to see what's possible when we access things from the menu. And coming to the VU meters, I call them VU meters when I say audio. This actually disappears pretty quickly, but, um, and there it went. But when we get here, um, it turns out right now that the left and right channels, which is to say channel one and channel two are ganged, they move together. The reason for that is the setup for this is that right now I'm talking into the Pocket 4K's um, mini XLR port and it's sending phantom power to a top quality Sennheiser shotgun microphone. And that shotgun microphone is then being recorded into the Shogun. It's kind of complicated, but you're getting a good estimation of the preamp quality via the um, XLR port. And um, so since I'm feeding the monaural um, XLR, since I'm feeding the monaural XLR input to both the left and right, or channel one and channel two, then naturally they need to move together because there's no point in changing the balance left to right if I'm recording a monaural source. So that's what's going on there. And I'm gonna go back to my 75-ish value, cool. And then this down here is just speaker and or headphones, um, which is not relevant right now. So exiting it out of there. Here we are now at, um, turns out I've talked about how all of these sort of ways to access menu items or parameter settings from the native or the sort of base touchscreen view, the live view, is sort of running in parallel to other ways to get there, such as the hard buttons, the dial, the top buttons, and then the menu itself accessible here. There is one option on the whole camera that I, as far as I could tell, where you actually have to touch only this to be able to get there. And so let's do it, and then it'll become clear what we're talking about when we get there. And sure enough, here's the interface where you can access the two card slots. On the left side, On the left side, you access the CFast 2.0 card. Um, my, I don't have any plans to buy a CFast 2.0 card. They're both low capacity and, and terribly overpriced because there's just simply no demand for it to scale the prices down. Um, the SD card slot is on the right, and I'll be using SD cards um, some of the time, but the great killer app of this whole Pocket 4K uh, workflow is the USB-C port on the side being able to connect to an extremely cheap solid state drive via USB-C um, uh, at reasonable bit rates that can handle all of the speeds, um, the recording bit rates of the camera. So CFast 2.0 would have an interface here if there were a card connected that's the same as this. Um, but let's go down what we see here. And the card is empty, and it tells you based on the current codec and frame rate and resolution, how much would be left. But what I really wanna hone in on here, um, and this isn't even gonna come up, so we're getting it out of the way now in the menus because you can't get here through the menus. Again, only through the main live view. Once we get here, we're told that the format is currently XFAT. It's important to kind of distinguish between that and the option you have for, for formatting in what they call Mac OS X which actually translates technically into HFS plus. And the thing about HFS plus, I'm gonna show you that when I click the format SD card item, and then it pulls up to the option where I could have chosen that. If I did choose to format in this, there's one problem with that. I cannot mount that on any operating system besides OS X, um, a Mac basically. So for maximum compatibility, XFAT is the way to go. Why? Because XFAT is a sort of uh, non-proprietary um, storage format, which can be mounted on both a Windows and a Mac. So this is extremely important when you change um, manufacturers of your PC, but also you're collaborating with other people and you want the lowest common denominator. What do you lose? Hardly anything. Um, there's anecdotal evidence as well as Blackmagic claims that when you save to HFS plus format, there, it's a safer environment when it comes to things like corruption and um, that sort of thing, recovery, file recovery. 
I think it's possible that it stores a little bit more metadata, uh, but um, XFAT is simply the way to go. So rest assured, or I should just simply assure myself, uh, I am feeling safe to format this now, but always take care. It does ask you one last time when you click this, are you sure you want to nuke all this stuff? I say yes. Funny quirk. Turns out that there's no way to change this. It'll always be actually an interesting sort of, I don't know, history scribe feature of the camera that it'll always count up. So it's going to rename my card to A007. And um, the next time I format, next number up. So I've got, got a ways to go in, this, in the long, hopeful long life of this camera. Why am I saying all this? Here's the main theme. The main theme that also is sort of anecdotally mentioned is the fact that formatting a flash memory in the camera using the camera's own operating system is a better thing in two categories of performance. One is the degradation of speed over time that flash memory tends to do because flash memory actually has its own circuits that reallocate memory space after the inevitable damage of memory cells that happens over time. There's the first issue. The second issue is that it is um, storing, it is, it is actually going to maximize this, the actual available space on the card compared to formatting on a Windows or Mac um, computer. And some of the reasons for that have to do with file allocation size in terms of the byte value. And the other ones have to, they go hand in hand with the way that it allocates memory cells um, over the life of the card usage. Bottom line, unless you have some good reason to do it elsewhere, always format using this function. And here we go. Formatting SD card. This is a mere 64 gigabytes because that's all I wanted to spend on a UHS 2V90 card, which is the only card speed class that can handle the fastest speeds on this particular device. So I'm exiting out. Home stretch on this main page. Um, the This is representing, of course, the empty CFAST 2.0 card slot. Um, both of these go to the same place. Here, again, back to the theme of the fact that there may be the occasional situation when you prefer to be able to initiate functions from the touchscreen so that you don't bump the camera, you're flying on a gimbal, what have you, this is the only place you have access to, hard buttons aren't accessible, and so on. You can simply tap this to start recording. So there we go. And then I can press this again. So, home stretch on all of the options from the back panel live view includes this record function, and this fits into the theme of the fact that there are some things that you might, in some rare cases, prefer to do from this back panel screen, uh, the viewfinder itself, rather than to use some of the hard buttons. Um, in the case of the Blackmagic Pocket 4K, there's a record button way up front over here, but there's also one really on the front panel for those who want to activate, if you will, the so-called selfie record button. God forbid you use a Pocket 4K to make selfies, but there you go. Um, here's another reason, though, rather like the other explanation of why you might want to activate things from this menu to avoid physically bumping the camera or pushing things, needing some force. And when you're on a stabilizer, you have those motors fighting against any such um, physical actions. It's just a mere tap that can initiate the record mode. So there I go tapping record. You can see it's counting up. And then um, the current um, media card that's being recorded to um, gets highlighted in red. So that's a great feature. And then I can tap it once again to make it stop. Rounding out the whole um, circle of life on the back panel viewfinder includes, this is a histogram. So take it or leave it. Histograms are something that I know a lot of people just love. I end up never using it. I think I rely a lot more simply on zebras and occasionally false color, which the camera does feature. There's some grumbling about the fact that the camera doesn't include um, the feature of scopes of a few different types. Um, but... Uh, there's only so much you can fit into a pocket, right? So speaking of which, um, we are finally arrived at the place where we're going to dive into each and every single menu item. But uh, as a reminder, um, the caption beneath this video, uh, and then in, this, in particular at focuspulling.com, there is um, a more interactive guide to all of these menus where you really can skip past a lot of the mumbo jumbo of the stuff you might not be interested in or already know to begin with. 
And that includes, especially at focus pulling, um, separate discrete video frames for each of the categories of menus um, and searchable clicks and that sort of thing, um, and index and so on. But you'll also get general time code index right at the caption below this YouTube video. So feel free to use that in case there's something that you aren't interested in. But um, as a preface to all of the menus, um, just to be thorough, we do want to go down the things that some of the things that can and cannot be controlled by the menus that are hard buttons as opposed to the back panel things. And in brief, this very top one gives a sort of one tap uh, grab of given that you have a native micro four thirds lens with electrical contacts, it gets a grab of sort of the aperture value that you might want in a sort of auto way, but it's not continuous. It's only on a one touch thing. And in the exact same spirit, you can do the same with this button right beneath it, which is grabbing focus um, from the crosshairs in the middle, since we didn't specifically pick on the touch screen any different spot than the middle. This toggles into one high frame rate mode. So HFR high frame rate. Actually, when I do it here, you'll see it goes to a rather unimpressive 60. So the um, uncompromised full resolution maximum frame rate of this camera is 4K at 60 frames per second, which is awesome. I mean, there's no other camera, especially at the size, um, at this kind of consume prosumer level that does that. But um, it actually is capable, this, this, this could toggle into another mode that's even higher than that, such as windowed HD 120 frames per second. But at the moment, it's just toggling basically back and forth between one setting. We'll explain more how to customize that. But um, this is actually pr a pretty vague control, and you'll probably end up um, changing into high frame rate mode using either the menus directly or a preset within the menus, which we'll explain later. Um, but anyways, that was toggling in, and I'm going to toggle back out to just the standard 30 frames per second. Below that, we have um, a pretty handy button. You know, it's not something you have to assign like on the A7 series. It's literally a dedicated magnifier button. And it's as simple as it should be, which is that you tap it once and you get the magnification. But since this is a truly elegant, full-featured touchscreen and very large at that and very smartphone, next-gen savvy, I love the way this works. I mean, God forbid any of the other camera companies finally catch up. I mean... Sony's A7 series is the farthest behind by having touchscreens that hardly incorporate any touch functionality. But on this camera, you can just swipe around. So instead of having to use cursors to get anywhere, you just swipe where you want to look and then tap again to toggle back to the non-magnified view. Finally, there's a playback function. And when we do play back, you can see it's counting up. And then, um, so there we go. And then I can press this again. So there's playback. A related concern with playback, and certainly related to this um, menu interface, the only place where you can manage the stored media, is the unfortunate fact that there is not only not a sort of playback list of all of the files with, let's say, metadata reporting how much time each of the clips is and so on, um, at least from these interfaces, but also it lacks the ability to delete individual files, which could be a huge bummer. Let's say that you did a shoot where you realized that you left it on for two full hours recording to an SSD. And then um, what you really wanted to do was to record something for two minutes. You can't delete the two hours. You have to reformat the whole flash media drive and start all over again if you wanted to get rid of that big uh, mistaken two hour file. So that's just simply a bummer. Okay. so. Um, we will skip for now some of these other top ones that aren't visible right now. We'll go to another view later, and that'll be cut in when we see fit. But we have finally arrived at the moment of pressing the menu button. That is actually one review-ish complaint that I have. I just sort of wish that the menu button, since we're going to be going there so much in our common use of this camera, it would have been nice for that to be discrete and for it to be at a different location and for it to be much less than in the mix. I'm sorry, larger than in the mix. So we end up going here more than any other button on the whole camera, but here we are. And I'm going to take us to the very first tab and we'll just go down the line in order.
the way that the menus are laid out is a little bit easy to miss at first because of these really subtle little dots at the bottom. But how many dots you see and which one is brighter white than the darker gray indicates to you not only how many, quote, pages there are per tab, or sometimes even per sub tab when you select something, but also, you know, which one you're on. So I'm in the first of three pages under the record category right now. You can navigate between the pages, not by swiping, unfortunately. Oh, I guess you can, if there's room. But the problem with getting used to swiping is that there's not sometimes room and you end up accidentally sort of touching one of these and changing the settings. But the easier way is to use the forward and backward, which is what I recommend all the time so you don't accidentally change a setting and then only realize it when you get back to the studio. So I'm going back to the first page of the record tab, and then you can see that the two um, codecs that it can record in are currently the type of RAW that is Cinema DNG RAW, quite honestly, a really wonky kind of RAW because of the fact that it saves basically JPEGs in a folder. Bazillions and bazillions and bazillions of JPEGs. So it's just always been a bane of RAW recording on Blackmagic, but um, you might have heard that there's this almost too amazing to believe new Blackmagic RAW that they'll probably need to figure out how to name differently, but it will be a kind of RAW that records in file sizes smaller than the equivalent ProRes file sizes. How did they do it? It has to do with hardware-based demosaicing and a lot of very clever tricks. Um, it's a little controversial because it's not true RAW, um, and I'm not talking about compression either, but it's still pretty damn close. And so it's going to revolutionize this whole camera. But for the time being, uh, I'm going to kind of ignore raw issues, but there's not really a lot you would have needed to know besides the fact that when you go into raw mode, you can either choose lossless, which is just a huge memory card, you know, suck, or you can go to three to one compression or four to one compression. And these are just compromises that you throttle based on your intended use. So you know, the common wisdom is why would anybody use raw and why would somebody in particular use lossless? So the kind of guy or gal who's going to use raw lossless, as the theory goes, is somebody who's, um, let's say, doing CGI work and is doing green screen work and is going to need to really color grade the hell out of something with multiple passes and generations and all that stuff. So one can see the value. When it comes to shooting regular video, we're in the ProRes world. Um, as much as I loathe that. I wish we could do um, all of the variants of Avid's DNX, HR, HD, and so on, but we don't have that. So Apple, your final days are here, but you, you still have a little life left in you in ProRes. And with regard to ProRes, as you probably know from the all the other cameras that shoot in ProRes, we got the same deal here. HQ, which is a little overkill, at least for my workflow, 422, which is my go-to for high-quality video. LT, which is a sort of light. I think that's what it stands for. Uh, it's a it's a bit rate, but it's a nice compromise. Incidentally, I'm filming all this stuff in LT because why on earth would I shoot in 422 or HQ for something that doesn't have any motion in it? Don't forget that compression is really about motion. It's not really about the complicated details of any intra-frame compression. It really has to do with um, whether you're driving the codec past its limit of being able to capture, let's say, thousands of fluttering leaves in a wide view of something. So these choices really can depend on the subject matter you're shooting. If you're doing an interview, I mean, my I'll always be tempted to use LT with some single face with moving lips and very little else moving. LT is the way to go. But these are all things trial and error. Anyways, that issue aside, let's go back to 4.2, my go-to rate, uh, bit rate that is. And then down here, we can change the uh, resolution of recording. And so when we do change the resolution of recording, um, we can do HD, Ultra HD, and 4K DCI. Uh, this is something that you're probably familiar with if you've gotten a camera like this or if you're interested in one. But in a nutshell, it's weird and it has to do with the funky way that actually what we what 99% of the world calls 4K is actually not 4K. This is 4K at 4096 pixels wide by 2160 down vertically. 
Ultra HD cheats just a tiny bit off of that by going down to or narrowing down to 3840 by 2160. This is a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Bottom line is that this is what all standard television sets, um, that's the native resolution of today's so-called 4K television set. And then we all know about HD, right? So there's HD. Interestingly, when I change to HD, and I'm going to actually flip to HD, but you're going to be watching it on the, um, the, the Shogun that's recording it. When I tap HD, you'll see it pop into a sort of two times crop. And so what's going on there is that it's in windowed mode. So it says resolution sensor windowed. When I'm shooting in HD, in order to maximize the quality instead of, of sampling, down sampling, um, to achieve uh, HD recording using the full sensor, that tends to compromise the image in categories like um, moiré and aliasing and other issues. It's always preferable to just simply basically cut out from the native resolution a window that is 1920 by 1080 pixels. So the effect of it is that it crops in double. So the crop factor actually in Ultra HD is two times. So that means that compared to a full frame camera like the a7 III, which is the camera I'm shooting all of this with for the menu view, that is 1x, if you will. It's the 35 millimeter reference standard. It's what 35 millimeter film looks like when stacked up against standard lenses that have specific millimeter values for focal lengths. So micro four thirds in general is two times. And sure enough, this camera is roughly a two times crop factor. It zooms in double when you hook a 50 millimeter lens on it. Right now with the live view we're seeing here, um, this is uh, a two times crop factor from 35 millimeter. Um, using a 25 millimeter lens makes it a 50 millimeter equivalent to 35 millimeter acquisition or full frame as they say. But again, when I go to HD, that's a four times crop factor. So my 25 millimeter lens becomes a 100 millimeter lens. So why am I mentioning this in terms of the menus? Um, because we're going to get later to a moment when we can actually change um, the way that it reads out the sensor and we can change it so that instead of windowing the sensor in HD acquisition, that it can actually downsample from the full frame, which is a goofy way of saying it. It's not a full frame sensor, but from the full frame of the sensor down to HD, we'll get there. But I'm going to go back to our ultra HD mode and continue on the second, so to speak page under the record menu gives us some interesting options that the first row has to do with, I think really what we should regard in practical terms as whether or not we're shooting in log or not. So the smallest background on log that most of you already know is that log is a way of flattening out images so as to be kind to the limitations of digital sensors and storage of media from digital sensors so that we can sort of unpack all of that flattened information back into a full dynamic range image that is commonly referred to as video or rec 709. And when we say rec 709, I've just flipped over to the Atomus Shogun and you can see a sort of less dynamic range, sort of more color intense and honestly, no other way to say it, less filmic. It's an abused term, but nonetheless, there's a ring of truth to it. It's a less filmic look to it. When I change to video, um, I get that, so to speak, less filmic look. Um, but when I go back to film, you can see the true sort of black magic proprietary log format. So film is where, in my sort of presumptuous opinion, is where any serious artist is going to spend all of their time when they shoot with the pocket 4k kind of like end of story. Sorry, anybody who wants to try these other two, but just so we know what the other two do, um, extended video is the gray area that 
I'm not joking and I'm not sneering, but I sort of am. I think half of all of the materials that are trying to explain the Pocket 4K on the net right now are explaining this wrong. Extended video is not some sort of, uh, I don't know, video boost. It's not like, you know, turning the volume up 50% on the quality of the video mode. It's rather, in, in essence, sort of baking in the LUT through a flattened film process. Now there is going to be an option in another menu where we can actually burn a given LUT into um, the actual recorded content. In other words, shoot using um, the flattened film log that is kinder to the sensor and, and sort of squeezes down the dynamic range and then unpack it before you even record it onto the card. We'll get there. Extended video is doing rather the same thing, but doing so using the native sort of um, internal processes and the native LUT, if you will. Um, and it does a little bit of smoothing of the highlights, which is, of course, the flaw of video mode that highlights blow out because it just simply has less dynamic range. So the, the way Blackmagic diplomatically describes why they have a video and extended video mode is basically to say, um, if you were a broadcaster and needed to go to air, let's say in 30 minutes after you stop recording, or if you're broadcasting live or whatever, that these modes can be useful to you for sort of, um, baking in the LUT, but not worrying about the sort of, um, tweaking that might be of necessary when you deal with shooting in log and converting back to rec 709 extended video is a great option. If you don't intend to do any uh, application of a lot flip side, a little pinionating there. I think it's a little senior citizen like and grumpy for anybody to claim that it takes time or God forbid they put a line item on an invoice charging for just dumping a LUT onto a video, but some people really passionately feel that way. And so there they are, but you're always going to be in film mode unless you have a good reason not to. You notice how window sensor is ghosted out here. It takes us back really quick to if we were in HD mode. And then when we're in HD mode, I have the ability now to turn off window sensor. And so um, right now, just by way of reference, I've flipped over to the view being recorded from the Atomus Shogun of the output of the camera. And you can see right now the four times crop factor, which is the 2x window sensor. Right now on the menu, I'm toggling window sensor off. But I'm recording into the internal Blackmagic Pocket 4K's recorder, SD card, in 1080p resolution, smaller file size, smaller resolution, right? So it's a way of avoiding the crop factor by downsampling from the full frame of the two times crop frame. So I hope that all makes sense by now, but that's how the way that works. But again, once I go back to Ultra HD or 4K DCI, full 4K, when I go back to the screen, you can see it's the window sensor option is ghosted out because it's not relevant when you're shooting in 4K because there's no downsampling to do from the full resolution. Project frame rate speaks for itself. You can toggle between all of them. Um, Off-speed recording, though, is the same toggle button that we got when we were in the main screen and we went over here to uh, frames per second. We were able to do it over here. Similarly, we can get to it here. And then when we do so, you can see the difference between the project frame rate, meaning what the camera is actually going to burn onto the card at what frame rate. And then the off-speed frame rate means um, the, the, this is the reference frame rate and this is the actual frame rate. So when it actually burns the content, the media, into the actual media file being stored on the memory card, it'll ac actually capture it at a formal 29.97 frames per second. But the amount of content being stored there is acquired at 60 frames per second. And the bottom line is that this is the way this is set up with this toggle on is um, slow motion. So half speed, slow motion, half speed over cranking, as they call it in the old days. I'm going to turn this back off. But I could have adjusted that to any variety of things in pretty kind of small increments, but not higher than 60. If we want to go into the other um, modes like 120 frames per second, that's a whole other monster that we'll do somewhere else.
down here on the bottom, um, you if you did have two cards in at the same time, this is a nice function that for which, again, there's been a little bit of old vet grumbling. Uh, I think a lot of people love the idea of redundancy because they imagine themselves as being super important that if um, they, even though flashcard never fails in my experience, there's this hypothetical scenario where it didn't record on one so you could have a redundant version recording at the exact same time in another slot. Um, the Blackmagic Pocket 4K doesn't have that capability. You actually do have that capability on the Alpha series with their dual slots. But, okay, big deal. But at least what they do give you, they throw you a bone with this option here where you can toggle it to say, okay, if I have both a CFast card in and an SD card in, only record to the fullest card, which is really sort of a space management thing. And that's kind of a cool feature. Um, I would never use that because I mentioned earlier, I'll never use CFast cards. But also, this also seems a little bit sort of, um, I don't know, confusing to me and risky and when it comes to managing your files because over the course of a shoot, it could change where it's storing things between the two cards and then you'll have a real mess waiting for you when you're doing your offloading when you get back to the studio. So I think you should just make your choice and stick with it. Um, finally, on the uh, bottom right, you have this toggle for stop record if card um, drops frame. And this is great. Um, it's especially great for us early adopters of the Pocket 4K because I'm really cheaping out and pushing this to the limits. FYI, um, the footage you're looking at right now, this test footage, is footage that I shot onto a UHS-1, not UHS-2, the UHS-1 card that claimed a maximum write speed of 60 megabytes per second. And 60 megabytes per second, don't forget, is, um, you know, you divide that by eight to get the actual megabits per second. Um, but in any case, uh, I hope I got that right. But the bottom line is that the, the, the ProRes profile and codec and bitrate that I was recording in, which was ProRes 422, was actually at a higher target bitrate. Now, when I say target bitrate, that means that if the motion got super fast and complicated and the details got particularly um, intense in any given sequence of images, then um, I could have gotten drop frames and it could have reached the ceiling of the, the again, the target bit rate of, of the given ProRes codec. All of this is to say that this is your safeguard. And if you are using this mode, then my strategy was, yeah, I'm going to, you know, especially if I'm just getting coverage where if I don't lose one shot, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to leave this on, but I'm really going to pay extra close attention to whether or not my record light is on, you know, whether I can see verification that I'm in record mode, such as right now when I'm pressing record, you know, just keep an eye on this mofo. Same up here with the red increasing um, time code, because as, as soon as a frame drops, it'll stop recording when I have that mode activated right here. So this is a nice tool to be able to try and push it to the limits. Granted, most of the time I'm going to be attaching a cheap solid state drive that exceeds the maximum bit rate of all my recording modes, which kind of doesn't, won't matter. This is a great sort of fallback measure. So lastly, moving on to the third page of the record tab, it begins with a toggle for time lapse. And this is a fairly simplified version of time-lapse compared to what you might find, let's say, again, in the Alpha series um, using, I think it used to be a Play Memories app, didn't it used to be called? Um, and other cameras have things that calculate um, things more on a target length and things like this. This simplifies it down to just simply toggling it on and then identifying this in the fine print. It says capture one frame every, and then you can say five frames at a certain point, the value changes to seconds. And way up here, for example, which would be a really fast moving, uh, fast motion by the time you store it, you'd only capture one frame every one minute. So what this is doing is 
it's keeping the, remember there was a project frame rate. It's going to keep that value. So it's going to end up with a file that plays back with content acquired at 29.97 frames per second. Um, and again, the off speed frame rate is off right now. But when time lapse is on, it'll dump into that target frame rate one frame every one minute. So the effect of it is to uh, play back images that look like fast motion. So I'm going to toggle it back off. Here you have something that's very much relative to this thing, other thing we were talking about on page two, which was video, extended video and film. Very similar to extended video. If I were shooting in that in a sort of broadcast environment, if I turned on detail sharpening, what I'd be doing is I'd be um, doing the kind of sharpening that I think a lot of cameras do that a lot of professionals hate. So if you're going to do a full-blown color grade and if you're going to be making decisions about what to sharpen, what not to sharpen, and so on, um, also sharpening itself, of course, degrades the image to a certain extent. At the same time, the kind of baked-in, broadcast-savvy look that one might want straight out of a camera without having to do any post-production would always usually include some amount of sharpening. The default probably approximates what most, let's say, how do you say, handy cams, camcorders, soccer mom camcorders, I hate using that term, but it's true, like that big market of people. There's always in the camera processor some amount of sharpening of the image. Um, by turning it off, you're a purist, you get no sharpening. By turning it on, particularly if you do this in tandem with, again, the extended video or video modes, you can bake in a certain amount of sharpening. That um, So in a nutshell, it's something that I think most of uh, the core user of this camera will always want to leave off, but rather like extended video and video shooting modes, um, which is to say picture profiles, it's great to have the option um, to be able to bake in some sharpening and then to adjust the amount. Finally, record LUT to clip is once again very similar to that because what it's saying is whatever conversion from film is loaded up, we're going to get there at LUTs in the end, whatever conversion is loaded up uh, will be actually recorded into the footage. Now, mind you, when we're actually acquiring the footage and recording it into the camera, when this is off, it really does record it in the flattened dynamic range. And that's the live view that we're getting as I flip over to the Atomus Shogun. When I go to monitor mode and on the HDMI output, I turn off display LUT, which we'll get to in a few moments. But... Um, that is the look of log color space without any LUT conversion. I'm going to toggle that back on. I'm going to go back to, excuse me, back to record to the third page where we have the option. If I turn this on, in other words, internally into the camera, um, I have the ability to actually bake in the LUT so that it doesn't record the flat log uh, color space. Bottom line there is you're probably never going to activate this. Um, and what you're probably more likely to do is to go into extended video mode. I could see somebody recording LUT to clip if they have some customized LUT, we'll be exploring this later, that they've loaded in. There's an interface here where you can load in custom LUTs. And then if you really wanted to burn that custom LUT in instead of the standard Blackmagic one using extended video mode, then this might be something for you. I'm going to turn that back off. So we're done with record tab and we're moving on to monitor. Arriving at the monitor tab reveals something that is different from all of the other menu functions in the sense that while you have a master tab, if you will, there's a sort of sub tab way that it works, which is different than any of the other menu items. So it's a little tricky at first, but once you'll get it, you'll really get it. And it has to do with the way that once you're in any of these sub tabs, then you're presented with multiple pages actually per sub tab. So normally it was under the record menu, there was just three pages under the whole record tab. Under the monitor tab, for each of these, you'll have multiple pages. But the odd thing is, is that for the LCD and HDMI tab, the first page, they're actually the same. So it'll make sense when we actually walk through it. But with the LCD sub tab, 
The only way I'm going to be able to do this is just to toggle back and forth and then to show you the results of things that I do. But we're talking about controlling what's visible from the actual back panel as opposed to the HDMI output of the Pocket 4K. I'm going to go back. So the first one is clean feed. And you can see what happens when I do that, that you simply get no overlays at all. So, you know, when you really think you've got it, um, then you can get a clean feed, right? I can't see myself doing that here as much as maybe over here, but we'll get to that. So that's with it on. I'm going to save these for when I do it, when you have a live view with the HDMI, because as you can see, you have the same options between the two on page one of each sub tab. But I'm going to go to page two of the LCD sub tab. And what you'll see here is that I have the ability to turn status text on or off. So that is all of the sort of things that we could directly access um, some of the menu options. So I'm going to turn it off and you'll see something different. You'll see that it almost looks like a clean feed, save for the fact that you still have some of the other overlays, but we don't have all these numbers at the top and bottom and, and meters and such. Um, there's that. But you, you notice what happened here is that when I swipe as if on a smartphone, they kind of appear and disappear. So that's kind of interesting. Um, the meters versus codec and resolution is a pretty fine point. Uh, I think HDMI doesn't have it. So it's really only relevant in this LCD tab. And when you're there, if I go to meters, then the view I'm getting is with the audio meters down here, and then an indication of, uh, and then a meter over here, which is the histogram, right? So I'm going to choose the other one, and we're going to see what the difference is. When I go to codec and resolution, instead of the audio meter, I get something that tells me what the resolution is over here, and tells me which codec it's recording into there. So you'll probably agree with me that these are sort of decisions you make at a, a sort of a master level that you wouldn't need to be constantly reminded of. So one can imagine staying on meters quite a bit more often. I found myself forgetting about what these mean though, because they aren't self-evident. So be really careful to keep it on meters all the time, unless you have a really good reason to go to codec and resolution. Lastly, screen brightness. Currently I have at hundred percent. If you need to save battery, I guess, I guess you could go down, but outdoors, I promise you, you're going to need that hundred percent. So those were the two pages under the H under the LCD sub tab. I'm going to go to the HDMI tab. And the first page of that, again, is the same settings on, as on page one of the LCD. And this is going to be a way. So noting what these are, I'm going to narrate through what it looks, what I'm doing as I toggle these. But now I'm flipping over to the view on the, uh, what the Atomos Shogun is recording from the HDMI output. And as that goes, Right now I'm turning on clean feed so that it erases all the overlays and then I'm turning off clean feed. And here I am turning off display 3D LUT. And so again, what that means is that as a sort of baking into the signal sort of toggle, I'm saying don't bake the standard film log to Blackmagic Rec 709 LUT lookup table cube file. Um, and then you can see, actually, this is the first time we've seen this, that when I record, um, when I see the image with the display 3D LUT setting off, that the shadows, which is to say the darker parts of the image on the left side, are not pure black at all. They're sort of this gooey white. The noise floor is a little more prevalent there if you were to really zoom in. Um, but these things go away when you crunch, if you will. Crunch is ironic because you're actually expanding back out the dynamic range to true Rec. 709 video color space and dynamic range and saturation and so on. So here I'm going to turn it back on again, and you'll see suddenly it starts looking normal again, if you will. Um, there is a zebra option, again, that I can turn on and off that I'm doing right now, but it's not doing anything because of the fact that we, don't, we aren't blowing out anyway. Focus Assist, I'm turning it off. And you can see the red sparkles, I say, go away. And then I'm turning it back on. You can see them again. So to remind you, I'm going to show you rack focusing. So when I tap on the box, 
There's my peaking on the box lettering. And then when I tap the camera, you see the peaking confirming that focus is hard on the camera. On the bottom row of page one of the monitor tab of the HDMI sub tab, you're seeing a live view of me tapping frame guide on. So that's going to what people abbreviate as scope aspect ratio, abbreviating cinema scope, which is 2.35 to one. We can adjust these later and we'll see that in setup. But um, the gray area at the top and the bottom are places where you wouldn't want to locate any um, critical, you know, framing activity um, because you are intending basically to crop that out, basically discard information when you're in post-production. That's not something I do. But if you are a hipster with visions of creating an epic Western when it's a mumblecore Brooklyn drama, then I guess you're going to use frame guides. Okay, so grid, I'm turning off and I'm turning back on rule of thirds. What is rule of thirds? Well, uh, you can see the top left. And in fact, I'm going to go back to the view of the, um, and this is a bit dogmatic and preachy, but the rule of thirds basically is a principle that people love to claim is meant to be broken, but end up anyways composing their shots sort of at least 75% of the time obeying. And what it's basically saying is particularly when it comes to human figures, um, if you have a person facing this way, which is to say that their, their look space is pointing in this direction and they have enough of it, then you locate their eyes at the juncture of the top left of this sort of tic-tac-toe board. And then if their look area were over here and they were located here facing this way, then you'd locate their eyes here. So it's these two junctures that are usually the most critical. I mean, yes, if you're Sam Esmail and Mr. Robot, then yeah, you might have them way down here, over here, whatever. But that's the permissible avant-garde. But for the rest of us, we're always locating particularly human eyes up at these two junctures. So a little speech on the rule of thirds. But going back to the HDMI output, um, I turned the grid back on, right? Um, here's the safe guide area on and off, on and off. What is the safe guide area? Well, this is funny. It's kind of, um, well, it's certainly outdated now, but the history of safe area guides is mostly because of boob tubes. Um, that means cathode ray tubes that overscanned, and you could never really be sure that the content was going to fit um, in the in what you thought you shot. So today, all monitors, um, and I'm going back to the main camera to show you the safe area. Um, all monitors today, all television sets that use LCD display technology and plasma technology, zero comma zero up here is always visible. And then 19, well, 38, 39 by and 2159, that pixel on the bottom right is always visible, okay? So the safe areas was basically saying in the old days that, you know, don't put anything over here because it's more often than not that a boob tube TV set that starts rounding out and curving out at the edges here will actually overscan and crop out some of that information where they actually stored some broadcast metadata. So little history lesson, but that's what that's all about. And some people use it as a tool you know, for framing, but you, let's assume that you're a competent cinematographer and you don't need to be, you know, handheld. So let's keep that off, but the option's there for you. Lastly, false color. Here's another area where, and I'm going back to the HDMI output, so you can see I have it off, and then I'm going to toggle it on. Here's off and on. And there are better people uh, and more qualified people to really explain how to use false color because I'm not a disciple of this technique, mostly because I'd rarely want to have it on. And my, my, especially as I'm running and gunning documentary style, um, you know, I'm never going to have stable, um, exposure and, and all else anyways, everything's changing by the second. 
So it's really hard to judge things when you have this goofy, disco-y um, aesthetic in your viewfinder. What some people might like to do, since after all we have, and this goes to the strengths of having separate settings for LCD and HDMI, by having separate settings, you could have like a separate monitor connected to the HDMI output while you're shooting with false color off, but make the HDMI output have false color on. And then um, you can have somebody else judging false color, using false color as a tool. And as for what false color actually does, again, best explained by people who really use it and, and value it. But in essence, what it's doing is it's dividing the image into various zones to represent different concerns of exposure and color. But let's turn it back off. So anyways, we made it through um, the first tab under the sub tab of, I'm sorry, the first page of the sub tab HDMI under monitor. But we get a different set of parameters than we got with LCD when it comes to HDMI. And this is really cool, very much related to the the workflow that I just described hypothetically of the false color paradigm. Here under HDMI um, uh, on the second page, we're able to turn on and off status text. That looks familiar, but what's new here is cinematographer director. So having seen this, I'm going to flip you over now to the view of the um, HDMI output um, that's being recorded on the Shogun. And just to let you know, it says display status text for cinematographer is the current option I have, but watch how the view changes when I tap director. We're getting a different set of tools. So cinematographer gives you the sorts of um, more exposure, um, codec, uh, color temperature, all of those settings that a cinematographer would be concerned with. I'm flipping now back to director. And by saying that the HDMI output gives us quote director information, it's giving us other information that a director would be more concerned with, such as time code, um, the, uh, the name of the media card, the, um, the amount of time left, um, the take and the name of the take if we do bother kind of typing in that metadata. So this is a great way to kind of present a completely different set of facts to the person who's watching a connected monitor on a set. And um, why give redundant information that the cinematographer is already seeing on their own display, um, but rather give the director a different set of information that's unique to, to the director's interests. So that was page two of the HDMI sub tab. And finally, we're on the both. So what both means, once again, is these are settings in common to both HDMI and LCD in terms of what you can see. And under both, we have frame guides here. And frame guides are letting us choose between the different parts, again, where we saw earlier how far we crop in. Um, the briefest kind of explanation of what these numbers actually mean is when you say 2.35 to 1, that's the sort of extra widescreen aspect ratio that you tend to see even when you watch Blu-rays and um, Ultra HDs and even DVDs. You can see sometimes even though you're watching on a widescreen TV set that there are black bars at the top and the bottom. Um, and so it's an expanded widescreen, um, 2.35 to 1, but it goes out even more than that. So we go to 2.39 to 1 and 2.40 to 1. 2.40 to 1 is, in particular, the aspect ratio that we associate with, let's say, CinemaScope, which was a standard um, that sort of dates, but it goes even wider. I think some Tarantino films have uh, exploited that aspect ratio. But when we go back, it cycles back to 4 by 3, and 4 by 3 is an aspect ratio that um, is basically the original aspect ratio of cinema for a long period of time. Um, that includes, for example, Casablanca, right? So also it's pre-digital TV aspect ratio, same thing. So it's more square. Um, 14 by 9 is substandard, but finally we're back to 16 by 9. The goofy thing about these lower ones um, is that 16 by 9, for example, there, you can't really think of a good reason to have a frame guide at the aspect ratio that matches the actual aspect ratio of the monitor. So you're probably going to be choosing one of these. But FYI, 1.85 to 1 that's the actual aspect ratio of DCI 4K. So 
um, there's a goofy reality about the difference between true 4K and UHD. Um, I think I got into this a little earlier, but in a nutshell, 1.85 to 1 is the 4096 by 2160 uh, resolution aspect ratio, whereas 16 by 9 is 3840 by 2160. So you get just a little more, um, but all television consumer TV sets, um, projectors, um, and so on, they're at 16 by 9 natively. So it's a bit of a stretch. I'll go back to that setting. I'm going to cycle through them real quick so you can see on the um, output of the HDMI, you can see on the Shogun what it's recording, and um, I'm just going to narrate through the settings that I'm going through. In the same order I went before, I'm toggling up to 2.39 to 1, so you can see the gray area at the top and bottom. 2.40 to 1, just a little less. And when I cycle back, I get 4 by 3 aspect ratio, so you get the, the dead area on the left and right. 14 by 9, 16 by 9. Of course, there's no frame guides because it's the full aspect ratio of any monitor, standard monitor. 1.85 to 1, it's doing just a little bit on the top and bottom. And then we're back to 2.35 by 1, where probably a lot of people will use frame guides. I don't have any sort of hipster pretensions to make a, uh, you know, epic Western aspect ratio for a mumblecore film in downtown Williamsburg or something. So um, you won't be finding me using frame guides, but I know a lot of people do. Moving along past the grumbling, uh, guide opacity is related to this while we're still on this screen because you can see how when I toggle up from 50% to 75%, I'm darkening the area some more. I can even make it 100% dark or I can make it extra slight, but 50% is a good area to be. You know, it gives you a peek into the area that you're not m intending to finally use. Back to the view of the main monitor in the back, and again, we're in the category that affects both the output at HDMI and the LCD panel on the back. When it comes to focus assist, um, there's colored lines and peak under the focus assist category. This is sort of I don't know, one could argue sort of poorly worded. And the reason you could say it's poorly worded is because we actually just always call this peaking. And really what the peak number or the peak setting means is non-color peaking. <laughs> and then colored lines means peaking in a certain color. Um, it might be something slightly different than that, but visibly that's what you'll see. And that's what you'll see right now. I'm going to flip you over to the other monitor again. And right now it's on the so-called colored line setting. But watch what happens when I tap peak. Now, there is peaking, but it's hardly visible because it's in the color white. Um, and then uh, what's more, if I go back to colored lines, there's this other setting where I can change what the actual color is. So right now it's red, but you can see I can change it to green and blue and back to white. And white is clearly more vivid than the peak mode. And then black, which is especially hard to, to separate out. But I guess it'd be more visible if you had a white uh, background. Um, so uh, these all have to do with your judgment on settings and contrast and so on. But I, most everybody in the known universe has it on colored lines and focus color set to red. And related to that, focus assist level, as we're looking at the back panel monitor again, you can see that when I have it on high, it's quite vivid. Now I'm flipping back to the Shogun view, what's recorded at HDMI. And when I flip right now, you'll see me toggle to low. And there's just a hint of what's in focus and what isn't. Medium gives me a little more. And I'm back to high again. So high is um, a way of achieving a reasonable balance between the most meticulous precision and the ability to basically nail it you know, reasonably. And so, like I said, most everybody also keeps things on high. Back to the back panel monitor. We are nearly at the end of the monitor, uh, both uh, uh, sub tab. But when it comes to zebra levels, 95% is the sweet spot where if you want to expose to the right, which is very advisable on Blackmagic cameras. I remember doing this on the Blackmagic Pocket a lot. You expose to the right... Um, in order to maintain the maximum flexibility in post, but it will require some work in post to bring things back down to earth. 
But the strategy exposing to the right is to set your zebras just below uh, when things will blow out so that you have a little bit of a wiggle room to account for error. Um, and then if you only have the brightest thing in the room zebraing, then um, you're able to really capture a lot of detail in the shadows. So at the same time, if you let something blow out, go above zebra levels, then you run the risk of it um, losing the content forever. When things are blown out in the highlights visually, there's nothing really to get back from it. It's the same thing right now. Forgive me when I do this, but um, when I speak loudly into this microphone like this, the clipping noise is not really recoverable. So we have the same principles at work here. Um, an FYI is that occasionally some people like to change the zebra level down to 70, 75%. And 75% is the general locale of skin tones. So if you want to expose everything and just let the highlights blow out if need be and really focus on getting exposure that is uh, sort of tailored or uh, prefers exposing skin tones correctly, then you might want to choose 75. But 95 is the go-to mode for most cinematographers. So lastly, last page, um, they're just minor little scraps. Um, they're about um, grids of thirds, crosshairs, and center dot. Um, and then the safe guide area size. I mean, let's ding that out of the way first. That was that stupid thing with the boob tube and the broadcast standards. So it's just not something that's relevant to any of us. But going to the other ones, I'm going to turn you back over to the HDMI output so you can get a live view of the stuff as I narrate the buttons I'm pushing. So the grids is set to thirds on, and here's what happens when I turn it off and back on. Crosshairs is off and on. Crosshairs are useful. I mean, they really don't get in the way. Um, if you ever wanted to perfectly center a shot, then crosshairs are certainly a very durable tool to do that. What else can you do, right? You're not going to have your talent hold out a ruler or something. And center dot is related to that, but, you know, it's just a dot. Um, hard to see. And then on top of that, sort of gives you that panic of, you know, burned pixel. <laughs> so uh, crosshairs accomplishes the same thing and better. So that finishes the monitor tab uh, and all of the sub tabs and the pages under that. So things will move on, I, I assure you, at a faster clip when we move along to audio. The audio tab is currently set to the channel sources being the same single source. So right now it's set to XLR. And this is going to be a little goofy. Um, because I wanted to go hardcore and record this whole video um, to prove the audio characteristics of the um, phantom-powered XLR input using a super high-quality Sennheiser shotgun microphone recording my voice right now. Um, I'm not going to be able to flip out of this because then I, you know, I lose my voice, right? But I can just tell you that this does cycle you through the following options. As I cycle through these, I could choose um, XLR line as opposed to mic impedance. I could choose um, the actual 1 8 inch stereo jack, and I could choose the camera's internal microphones. But the cool thing is, is that I can choose them independently per channel. So having said that's cool, there's sort of a bummer that goes with that. And the bummer is that you can't allocate, let's say, a mix of the left and right stereo coming from the camera's speakers, internal speakers, I'm sorry, microphones. You can't mix that with the XLR input. Nor can you even choose, let's say, the XLR input for channel one, which is traditionally left channel, right? Because the, the recorded media will always only record uh, two channels, left and right. The, you can't have XLR on one and then a mix of left and right stereo into the right side or channel two. So none of these combinations can result in any conceivable mix down of any sort. You have to basically choose one channel per um, input and you have to allocate one thing to each of the two channels. So that's how it goes. Right now, I showed this earlier when we went to it from 
this way, which is to say you can always just tap the peaking and get this little flyout menu. But the more in-depth menu is here. And then I also mentioned that the channel one and two gain volume control are ganged. And that basically means that as I move them, they have to move together. That's cool. That's what we want. Um, but if I had these set, per, set to different sources, then I can move these independently of each other. Moving on to page two of audio, headphones volume and speaker volume are independent of each other. Um, the, when you plug in headphones, it doesn't have that behavior of deactivating the speaker. Um, so you can, uh, you can adjust them independently. And then quite unrelated to that, but I guess it's like, oh, we need room on page two. They actually have something that really is related to the setting that I currently have it at, which is this XLR. And this you have to be careful about for, I don't know, I'll say, I'll boil it down to at least three categories. First category you have to be important about, uh, careful about. If you leave this on and you don't need it, your battery is going to drain dramatically faster. So that's just simply, so to speak, issue one, okay? Um, issue two with leaving it on accidentally is that if you leave it on accidentally and plug something into the XLR port that isn't a condenser microphone normally designed to receive 48 volts of phantom power, then you run the risk of frying it. So an example of that is a ribbon microphone. A ribbon microphone is one of those old-timey microphones that you've seen maybe sitting on Letter David Letterman's desk years ago, um, and so on. And ribbon microphones don't receive any electricity to uh, become as sensitive as they need to. Um, a shotgun microphone receives phantom power. A lavalier microphone receives phantom power. But... Um, other mics like dynamic mics don't. So if you leave this on and you plug in a microphone that isn't a condenser microphone into the XLR jack, then you risk frying it. There's no like fuse or regulator or something. So it's something to be careful about. And then the third reason is, is that this sort of um, operates in tandem with this. So you want to keep an eye on this because of the fact that when you leave XLR mic, and you go to XLR line or to the um, stereo eighth inch port or the internal microphones, then you need to keep an eye on this as to whether it's on or off because you, when you want to go back to XLR mic mode. Incidentally, one last thing on this is that this becomes ghosted out and cannot be toggled if you are in any other mode than XLR mic, okay? So that went faster. We've just finished the entire audio tab, but we need to dedicate a little more time to setup. So here we go into the setup tab, which has numerous functions, but they're pretty easy. When it comes to setup, you get all of the regular things, such as the date and time. And when you dig into that page, it's as standard as you could expect, including the time zone. The only thing I'll mention there is that you do have to be careful to choose the time zone according to the actual um, GMT relative time zone that can change in the United States, for example, based on daylight savings time, FYI. Because right now it's at negative four. After the time changes, I'm gonna need to manually change that to negative five because I'm in the East Coast, Washington DC area, where negative five is the other part of the year. So that's just a little proviso there. Um, language English, shutter, that's the one I'm talking in right now anyways, I think, if you can understand all this. Shutter measurement of angle and speed. I mentioned this before. I'm gonna show you what it looks like when I go to shutter angle. So when I go to shutter angle, um, I have toggled that. I'm gonna leave here and show you that. What's changed is now it says shutter angle 360. So that's bad actually. Shutter angle 360 means that I'm not gonna get the proper motion blur. And I alluded to this earlier, and basically proper motion blur means that on any given one frame, if you account for the fact that you're gonna stack, let's say 30 of them in a second, you want there to be at least a little blur for particularly faster moving objects. If it looks too crisp, then even 30 frames per second will look a little stroby. It'll look unprofessional. It'll give the characteristics that we attribute to cheap cell phone videos. What I wanted to do was actually change the shutter angle to keep it at, wow, at 180. So 180 is 
the sort of, they call it the 180 rule, which is a lot different than the rule that has to do with, um, you know, breaking the line between actors in a conversation. Totally different. This 180 rule is about motion blur. So here's the way it behaves. If I change my frame rate, that value can stay the same, but I can rest assured that the actual shutter speed will adjust to preserve the 180 degree shutter rule, okay? Now, the other way that it works is the way I had it, and honestly, the way I prefer is when I have it on shutter speed, when I go back here, at 1 60th, just to repeat, that 60th is the 60 amount is the denominator of the shutter, uh, shutter speed is meant to be double the frame rate, the 180 degree rule manifest. So we can choose between the two options. Um, shutter speed though is a, is quite honestly a more precise way of always keeping track of what your camera parameters are precisely at all times. And it's the one that I prefer. Flicker free shutter based on, um, without getting too technical about this, the nutshell on this will be that, uh, or the simplest version of describing this is that if you're traveling in Europe, set it here. And if you're traveling in the United States or other territories that have AC power and lights flickering in alternating current at 60 cycles per second, you tap this and then much of Europe is 50 Hertz and other places in the world. So know where you are and adjust accordingly. Down here on the left, you can see a setting that says image stabilization, which is a little misleading. And it actually doesn't behave in a way that um, sort of monitors and adjusts based on what you have connected. So to explain what that means, when it's set to on, it's basically saying if you happen to have a lens that also has the capability of stabilizing the image inside the lens itself, as opposed to in-body stabilization that regrettably the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K lacks, just as the GH5 lacks, GH5S lacks, even though the GH5 has it. So this is there's no internal stabilization, but rather if a lens has that feature, then you have the ability to turn it on or off using this toggle. Now what's goofy about what's happening right now is that I have currently a lens connected to it the 25 millimeter f 1.7 Panasonic that doesn't even have the capability. So when I toggle this on and off, the simple fact is it has absolutely no effect on anything. It's not doing anything. So it's more of a if then uh, toggle than anything that actually does something as you toggle it. Um, and that's an important distinction because what they could have done is they could have actually just simply used the lens contact information coming from the lens to confirm whether or not the lens has image stabilization capability. So this could have been ghosted out to in those, in those times when a lens is connected that doesn't have image stabilization. As an aside, it turns out that the whole micro four thirds community is extremely skimpy and sort of, uh, I don't know, um, dishonest actually about the value of lens image stabilization. And one of the problems, the flaws in the logic is the fact that they think that low millimeter values for focal lengths after a certain point mean that you just don't need lens image stabilization. But the problem is if you have a two times crop factor, then what seems like a wide angle lens, the current one being 25 millimeters, it's actually a 50 millimeter lens. And for 50 millimeter lenses, it's fairly well known, fairly well established that you should have in lens image stabilization of some kind. So uh, 25 millimeter lenses never have image stabilization. It seems to begin around um, 50 millimeters or so, which is really 100 millimeters in the micro four thirds world with this type of crop factor, even on a GH4 and so on. Um, the 12 to 35 millimeter F 2.8 lens is the absolute go-to lens for the Blackmagic Pocket cinema camera 4k just as it was for the original pocket for me anyway because it has power ois and there's a switch on the actual lens that operates redundantly in tandem with this so this is a huge stew of competing settings because the lens can activate and deactivate image stabilization 
the menu can activate it and deactivate it regardless of whether the lens is compatible. So there are layers of things to keep aware of. So I think the whole lesson from this is that there's no lesson besides be careful and just you have to double check these settings all the time. Another lesson I think should be, why on earth would you ever want to turn this off? There are some hardcore people who think that sometimes you need to turn off image stabilization because it drifts, but really that's the least of concerns. Sometimes they'll say that about footage that has 50 other problems that they should have not dealt with. So you should always leave image stabilization on when you can get it. Even when you're flying on a gimbal, um, image stabilization from lenses and from bodies on cameras that have stabilization in body really still helps smooth out steady cam footage further. So it's just a no brainer to always have this on. Time code drop frame. That has to do with um, something that's uh, something I actually lack a lot of experience with because I use standard modern uh, time codes and um, codecs. But to the extent that you're dealing with a mix of drop frame and non drop frame footage, this becomes relevant and I'll leave it at that. That was page one of setup. This second page under the setup tab is dedicated to three physical function buttons that are on the top of the camera. They're just labeled with one, two, and three dots. And it's sort of like under the monitor menu when there were sub tab behaving um, buttons, but not quite so extreme. But it turns out that as I tap F1 or F2 or F3, that it in turn pulls up a variety of changeable parameters as if this is a sub tab. So right now I have F1 activated and then under the F1 button, I've assigned um, one of either two possibilities to either have it control a so-called preset or something to toggle. Already there, I think there's some do criticism here for Blackmagic mistakenly using the word preset because it's already a conflict of terms with this whole dedicated menu called presets that actually does something totally different than this preset function. So bad call on their part, but we will get to the presets menu next and you'll find there that it actually is the holy grail of the true preset definition it's just that it isn't directly accessed by physical buttons, which is a bummer. But when it comes to this preset function, it in fact only lets you access five different categories of presets and then specific values on the bottom row underneath. So again, I've said that um, the physical first function card, the first, the one dot car uh, buttons, excuse me, is going to control a preset and then the preset I've chosen is white balance. And I've said, always make that button turn the white balance to 3200 Kelvin with zero bias when it comes to tint. Um, I could have chosen the toggle mode. And there, I would have been able to choose a parameter down here that simply toggles um, between different functions that are otherwise generally buried in the menus. So I have um, optical image stabilization. It's also another change in terms that I think will confuse a lot of people. But that's related to that toggle switch we saw earlier for turning on image stabilization and off. Or clean feed with regard to either LCD or HDMI. So you can see there's also sub parameters rather like there was under preset. So all of this is sort of very confusing as well as overlapping terms. And I didn't find terribly useful um, besides the two examples or the examples that I have loaded up that I'll explain fully in a second. But you can see how you can have it toggle display LUT, frame guides, focus assist, false color, zebra, grid, safe area, off speed recording, and back to OIS. So. Not a lot of stuff that you would frequently be toggling. You certainly wouldn't frequently be toggling optical image stabilization. I've advocated leaving that on all the time anyway. And I mean, seriously, safe area guide, let's get real, right? So that was the toggle option, but under presets, similarly, there's just not a lot here. Frames per second, iris. I mean, after all, nearby the hard button, you do have physical dials 
to change um, ISO, shutter, white balance, iris. And then when it comes to frames per second, you know, you can change them, but you can't go to the, you know, the killer um, 120 frames per second frame rate immediately, which is something you have to do by changing the actual recording codec into HD. So um, that's also of limited value because it doesn't give you the full range anyways of changing frames per second. So what I chose is just to assign to the first button uh, the preset for white balance at 3200 Kelvin. And then for button number two, I made my preset white balance be 5600 Kelvin. So I'm going between daylight and indoor, right? And then for the third one, I had it toggle um, uh, on and off false color, believing that might be helpful. But again, none of these things are particularly useful. What I would have loved for it to do is to actually to make things even more confusing, to have these buttons be able to call up specific presets, but we'll get there next. But in a nutshell, um, it offers just a slight functionality that saves you just a tiny bit more time. But where we're, where we're really going to find excitement is in the presets uh, category, which is a whole bank of presets that you can store. Uh, but unfortunately, you can't access them directly through any physical button, which would have been great. Uh, that was the uh, second of four pages under setup. So there go the function buttons, which are sort of a bust. The third page um, are more, you know, system level preferences, basically. And here on the front, while you're recording, there is a pretty substantial red tally light. And tally light basically meaning that while recording is on, it stays on. But you can make it invisible, as it were. So in other words, if you wanted to hide the fact that you're recording, then you can have this set to off. Um, as to the brightness of the LED, the red LED, it can be at low, medium, or high. So that's that. Um, reset camera settings is a factory reset. So we've all seen that on any number of electronic devices and it just does what it says. What can we say about that? Um, a related thing to that is the fact that one thing I love about this camera is that there are a few areas, actually when we get to the end here, presets and LUTs, when, where you can actually export from the camera two files that you will in turn be able to re-import back into any Blackmagic Pocket 4K. So if you did a factory reset, or if it got reset for some other reason, or the settings got mixed up and you wanted to restore back, it offers you the ability to restore your camera the way it was before, which is pretty awesome. Hardware ID down here is um, just something for kind of, you know, maintenance purposes, serial number-ish sort of assignment, um, software version number. So, you know, it, for example, this number will increment when we hopefully get Blackmagic RAW capability. Playback of all clips versus a single clip is sort of a relative to that loop button we saw under playback. So it could just continue on to the next one. One can imagine, for example, if you were really kind of like a mobile unit and you created a series of videos and you wanted to kind of have a, let's say, exhibit display or conference display that cycles through a few clips and plays them back in sequence as a sort of promotional series then you could go to all clips, but that's a small point. Uh, black shading calibrate sensor is something that you can do on a lot of cameras, but not all cameras, but it has to do with something that feels like burned pixels, which is that you could be looking at a, at a pretty solid image and then suddenly one pixel is burnt out. Usually that's a disaster on, let's say, computer to monitors, for example, because then they're just always going to be there. Camera sensors have a weird... Um, quality where sometimes you need to reset, that is to say, calibrate the sensor um, when some of those pixels show up. And the way to do that is to put a lens cap over the camera and then tap this. But, you know, this isn't the time now with a brand new camera that doesn't have any damaged pixels. So, but that's something that that would do. Moving on to the last fourth page. Sadly, I mentioned this earlier and grumbled about it. The Black Magic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K is only remote controllable by an iPad. So I'm just going to say the stat again. Uh, in the holy war between the cult of Steve Jobs and the rest of the world, 
So iOS has a market penetration um, that is dwarfed by the 88% worldwide market penetration of Android OS, but companies like Blackmagic always author things for iOS first, and then maybe eventually get around to authoring things for Android. So that's the case here. So none of these things apply unless you have an iPad. If you do have an iPad, then you can get an app, and you can control a lot of these parameters, but not all of them remotely using the iPad. So now that we've finished the fourth and last page of the setup tab, we're ready to move on to the very brief tab that's as big as you want it to be of presets, because it will be filled with presets that basically store every single setting that you currently have on your camera into a slot one of 10. And this is again to be distinguished from in the setup menu we had um, on page three, or I'm sorry, on page two, the ability to assign what we called or what Blackmagic calls a certain type of preset in certain limited categories to either each of the three hard function keys at the top of the camera. Whereas here, the word presets means things that you create that can be called up at any time to change every single setting in every other category of the camera. And so the ones that I've created so far call up a variety of things, and it makes sense for there to be at a minimum, let's say one that sort of, uh, I don't know, anticipates the shooting conditions and the settings of indoors and outdoors. So for example, I can't load them up right now because it'll change even the mic settings and suddenly the audio drops out, for example. But for the indoor settings, sure enough, I have loaded up um, or stored into that bank that I could load up with this check mark button. It would have the temperature, the, the in other words, the white balance set to tungsten lighting. It would have the ISO at a somewhat higher value than I would use if I were outdoors. And of course, outdoors, I would have the color temperature set to be sunlight or cloudy or whatever. Um, also down here, I have slowest motion as another mode where once I select it, I'm in windowed HD at 120 frames per second. My color temperature incidentally is outdoors because in almost all cases when I do slow motion, I'm outside. So you, know, you can see how all of these things can be really useful for quickly switching over. But again, the big regret is that I would have loved for these presets to be able to be called up instead of having to go, let's say that I'm shooting out in the field, and then I would have to go to the menu button which is already small and sort of lost in the mix as it is, then I'd have to go to the presets tab, I'd have to select one of them, and then I'd have to press the check mark down here to confirm. So that's less of a good thing than if I were able to assign one of these three preset hard preset buttons um, to at least arrive at this screen, let alone be able to have it associated with one of these presets. And again, it can hold up to 10 of them. When you receive the camera, it has none, but you can create one by pressing this plus button. So what this does is it lets you give it a name. And so I'm just gonna type the word test, but it's gonna be in effect, since I haven't changed, it's gonna be a copy of the one that I currently have loaded. And I say update. Update is a word actually to describe create when you've used the plus sign. And now I have that added to the list. Now if I tapped it, it still isn't active until I actually select the, the check mark, which I can't do right now because it'll shut down the microphone and blah, blah, blah. But there's a couple other things to see here, and that's that if I do have this you know, selected here, and let's say I made one change. So I'm going to make a change Let's say, let's say that my change is to make uh it displays shutter angle instead of shutter speed pretty small stuff but let's say that's the big whopping change um i've previously created something called twist you just saw me do it but what i could also do now that i've made the change um, since it won't be stored there until i do something i click this the sort of two arrows in a circle and it's asking me do you want to update the preset named test with the current settings. And I say, sure, that's exactly what I want to do. And now it's done. So that's how that works. There's one more thing to see over here, and that's this um, other icon that indicates 
that it is the preset manager. And the preset manager is basically the way that you can import presets from a previous export from a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Or you can export the currently selected preset. If I had one selected and I don't, but if I did, then I go here and I can select export and I can export to the card that's currently loaded, which is card two, right? Or a card slot two. And it'll show up as a file that I can in turn import back into this. So there would be two scenarios when that would be awesome. One of them is if um, I got a brand new Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K because I'm working in a collaborative group with multiples of these and I want to have all the same presets on everybody's cameras. That would be easy using this export and then of course import back, right? The other scenario would be um, if I do, I think we saw earlier there was a reset on page one where you can uh, do a factory reset. Here it is on page three actually under setup, reset camera settings. I'm not going to dare do that now, but if I had done that, then I'd be able to restore all of the, the presets that I exported by importing here. We're going to see that, by the way, also in the LUTs category. So there's that. And of course, another way of maintaining all of these is that you can trash them. So actually, I'm not wedded to this test after all. So I'm going to click this. I'm going to say, do you want to delete test? Yes, I do. And now it's gone. So thank God that they gave us the ability to at least um, manage these before. I mean, the original Pocket didn't have presets, let alone even the ability to delete um, anything that's stored on the card. So there's the presets menu and how it works. Finally, we get to the LUTs tab. And in the LUTs tab, we actually are preloaded with four. And so unlike other um, tabs here where we had to go forward and backward for pages that have very different functions, this is just a matter of going to page two only because there's overflow. And ironically, it's on the overflow page by default when you get your Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K that the one you'll probably use the most often is the one that's currently selected and highlighted. Um, what this communicates to you is that you have the LUT available for any time you want it applied to your footage, either for viewing or burned into the actual stored media that currently is set to convert the film log mode to video, which is to say Rec. 709 video, standard video, basically. So knowing that that's the sort of definitive default mode that we're likely to use most of the time, it's worth quickly exploring what these other three that they gave you mean, with the latter two here actually being pretty obscure at this point so far. Uh, the first one, though, is basically saying that we will, yes, use um, the Pocket 4K film log mode, but we're converting it to extended video as opposed to just video. And extended video added a few things like uh, a further highlight roll-off. Um, what that does is it basically gives you more of a fudge factor, breathing room, a tolerance um, for broadcaster scenarios, such as when, again, in the spirit of the record mode that says um, on page two that you go to extended video or video. When, you're when you bake in a lot of the um, s sort of things that don't require you to go into post and do further tweaks via applying a LUT, this is the mode you would want to use if you wanted to either view things that way or burn them in. Again, to be specific, whatever I have loaded here as my current LUT, I'm able to then turn on, such as on um, this page, I can say record LUT to clip on or off, right? And then in the monitor mode, I had the ability to say that I want, for example, at the HDMI output to um, have the 3D LUT displayed. Let me actually switch you over to, um, I'm going to go back to recording in the film mode, and then we're going to go to the monitor here. And then I'm going to narrate to you toggling off this display 3D LUT. But we're looking now at the HDMI output, um, what's being recorded onto the Shogun. 
and you're seeing currently that it's converting the film log to basic video. But when I toggle this off, you'll see that we get that unconverted ultra flat color space where in particular, if you look on the left side that used to be very dark and almost black, it's now this, you know, higher noise floor and sort of gooey grayish um, color. So the shadows are missing and I'm going to um, press right now. I'm toggling display 3D LUT over HDMI back on and you can see things look back to normal. So going back to the view of the back panel uh, viewfinder of the Blackmagic Pocket 4K, I'm in the LUTs menu and you can see that um, we're able to that 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 we're able to have that be the currently selected one if we click the check mark and then I'm going to go back again I'm going to toggle and then we're looking at the view of the HDMI output it's on right now and then I've turned it off and back on and the currently selected active LUT is converting to extended video which adds a little bit more highlight roll off in case I had highlights that were blowing out but in this case I didn't so it's hard to see the difference between the conversion using this versus the other. But to explain what's going on beneath here, I'm going to activate Pocket 4K Film to Rec 2020 Hybrid Log Gamma. And that's a fairly uh, uncommon uh, log mode um, that in turn would be converted in an editing timeline to what's more commonly called in the consumer um, video world, HDR. So a lot of 4K TV sets will display in HDR. And HDR is presenting, uh, it's a symbol, or it's an abbreviation for high dynamic range, but it includes even more than that. It includes more color gamut um, and other characteristics that are able to present more material. The great thing about log is that it can capture uh, a lot more material to be expanded out into this larger color space of Rec 2020, as opposed to Rec 709, which is represented by this mode and this mode. But that doesn't automatically get you to a better looking picture. This is anticipating that you're going to edit a film together and that you're going to apply a LUT that converts back to the proper Rec 2020 hybrid log camera. So what this mode is saying is get the, uh, get the convert the non HDR non rec 2020 film log capture into HDR rec 2020 log, which in turn has to be converted to something that can be then natively displayed on an HDR playback monitor or projector. So then right below that LUT profile, there's this next one that says pocket 4k film to rec 2020 picture quality gamma. And so this, the distinction is, is that this is going to take the Pocket 4K's film log acquisition and convert it straight over to the display format of HDR Rec 2020. So that, for example, any compatible HDR TV or projector can display the wider color gamut and dynamic range of HDR without needing to um, be converted from that hybrid log gamma log format in an editing timeline to the final color space. It's skipping a step in some ways like extended video, but starting from the uh, Pocket 4K's film log mode. So after going through this last tab called LUTs, we really have made it through every single feature in the menus when it comes to all of the tabs and the sub tabs and the pages. We also started out by going through the visible items here that can be clicked on and then adjusted in tangent and parallel with a lot of these menu items. We talked about some of these hard keys on the side. We've referred to some of the hard keys on the top. You can see that they control ISO, shutter speed, and white balance. You can also see that there's a hard power button, a caveat there, um, lots of cameras actually have a power switch that is also works in, in harmony with a sort of sleep mode after a while. It turns out that this camera doesn't behave that way. So it's just a word of warning that if you do have it on the on position, then it will um, just simply 
uh, keep going until the battery burns out. Or if you have it plugged into AC power, it'll just never turn off. Um, but it is nice to have a hard switch compared to the old days of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera because that sucker would actually turn on even with a bump um, because it didn't need a hard long press. It just, with one short tap, it would turn on and then you'd find that your batteries were, were uh, consumed. One last thing that seems worth to me mentioning and exploring as an added feature of this camera that really wouldn't have come up in any of the menus because of the fact that it isn't something that you turn on or off or change in the menus, but rather just works hand in hand with whatever ISO setting you have, is this feature called dual native ISO, or at least that's one way to put it. It's shown up in the past on Panasonic cameras like their Veracam. It showed up most recently and at the most widespread level in the GH5S. And basically what it is is something that basically at a certain threshold kicks into a different sort of, I don't know if you want to call it electrical circuit from the same sensor. So um, the easiest way to describe it is that any uh, sensor has a native ISO at which you're likely to get the best dynamic range and the best balance between high noise floor and lack of noise. So you know, ISO as a general principle is sort of a volume control on brightness. Um, it works in parallel with things like iris and shutter speed when it comes to the impression you get of how bright the image is. But um, in addition to those other more physical factors, ISO is simply turning up the electricity, if you will, on the brightness. So you can see my zebra is starting to kick in when it's really starting to blow out because my ISO is way too high. And then if I go down too low, below 200, we're seeing that I need more. But it turns out that 400 is the first base ISO at which the camera performs well um, with low noise and with the full extent of its possible dynamic range that's also represented in the film log curve that records internally on the Blackmagic Pocket. But it turns out that there's a second native ISO that is just as ideal, at least theoretically, and that's way up here, like way up here at 3200. But that doesn't mean it's the cleanest uh, signal in terms of noise level, and it doesn't even mean that it has the best dynamic range. It just means that that's the native uh, ISO amount. But where you'll get the cleanest quality when upon triggering, if you will, that second higher native ISO, the first high ISO being native ISO being 400. So with this test, we're starting at 400 ISO in that 400 ISO sensor mode, and we're clicking up in the menus to increase the value towards the top end of that 400 ISO sensor mode. But watch what happens as we move from 1000 to 1250. The look really changes, and actually the noise floor goes down, and we begin to click up to the actual second native ISO, which is at 3200, where the noise floor becomes barely tolerable. So that went by fast. We're going to do it again, but zooming in to get a closer look. And now that we're magnified to 500%, we can really look closely at the digital noise caused by the ISO increasing. And as it clicks up, it gets worse. But here's again the critical point. When we surpass 1,000 and click over to 1250, the 3200 ISO sensor mode means that the noise went down again, and now it's incrementing back up until what's barely tolerable at 3200 ISO, but it even goes up from there. Did you notice, though, something about how not only the grain changed, but the color? And next, to really emphasize that difference, I've grabbed stills, and I'm increasing exposure in Premiere um, to overexpose so that we really get a close view of that noise, grain, and color. And so certainly you can see the difference in noise, but also it shows how just inherently in digital noise, which is really electrical noise from the sensor itself at that lower 400 ISO sensor mode being pushed way up to the top end of its limits, you also inevitably get chromatic aberrations, not of the lens sort, but literally aberrations of color, meaning that noise introduces things that gunk up the true color. 
But I don't think that's the only thing in play. I think that the other thing going on is that the single film log curve designed by Blackmagic for this camera is being asked to do double duty for a dual native ISO camera for each of the modes, when in reality, the color spaces are different between the two sensor modes. And so it may not give lab accurate identical results as between the two of them. The log curve is itself a sort of mathematical computation designed to apply um, a sort of flattening and then expanding back. But it needs a consistency that simply isn't the case when you're flipping back and forth between two radically different sensors, if you will. I mean, it's still the same sensor, but two very, very different modes and two different, different behaving modes, if you will. So um, it's best left to people who are professionally able to do these sorts of lab tests. But I have found that when I'm grading footage um, at the lower uh, sensor mode of 400, and then when I'm grading footage at the higher one, even if I've applied the exact same LUT, and even if I'm equalizing, let's say, the exposure so that they look identical, it simply looks different. I have to tweak the color more in all of the tactics that a professional color grader follows in order to make them match. So it's almost like I'm shooting with two different cameras. And it occurs to me that maybe the film log uh, LUT and original film log curve might have needed to also change depending on whether or not you're in the 400 ISO native uh, uh, sensor mode or in the one that's keyed to 3200 that begins at 1250. Um, but then again, that's a sort of consumer trade-off where Blackmagic also would have then had to deal with the incredible confusion of people having to apply, I guess, really two different LUTs to two different log curves. So we work with the compromise, but there's nothing really pure about this. And I don't know if dual native ISO or triple or quadruple, for God's sake, is really where camera technology is headed. I think it's more that we're just going to keep um, having less of this sort of electrical noise and distortion as our light sensitivity continues to increase. And that's already the case as we migrate to full frame sensors. But Blackmagic is in this pocket form factor, at least, sort of still stuck in the micro four thirds space, which has a very low light sensitivity. And with that, I am left wondering whether there's anything more we could possibly say about the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. We've covered literally everything, but maybe a, a good parting thought is that it's not knowing every little thing about the camera, but ultimately the art that you create with it. And so to that end, years ago when the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera HD came out, I was one of the first to get it. I ran around New York for a couple of days, made a video, went at least for me and especially for that time viral. And it sort of led me down this foxhole of making more videos. I created uh, a commentary on that. I made a rigging video. And it also opened up some doors. So it is a little bit revolutionary for the 4K to finally arrive in that tradition. I'm sort of not feeling it this time around. But maybe that's just because technology has advanced so much and opened so many doors for independent filmmakers to achieve cinematic looks and techniques but the black magic cinema camera user group is there for you and it is the place where uh, your work is shared and promoted and the ways to do that are to join the vimeo group and add your clips to the queue when you tag them with black magic and they get promoted out to the facebook page and the twitter feed and if you have something on youtube just send me a note and i'll add it to the queue